right. The future of Java and you, or as I sometimes like to call it, how to participate in the future of Java. So I work at Oracle. So this is my safe harbor statement about all the future things I'll be talking about. Uh, I'm here from California. I'm the chairperson and director of the Java Community Process Program. I started working with Java back in 2000 at Sun Microsystems. So it's been almost two decades now since Java 1.2. Uh, but really what I like so much about my job and what's kept me involved um, with the Java community for so long is working with Java developers all around the world. So that truly is my favorite part of the job in my role as a chairperson of the JCP program. I do a lot of other things, um, but this is really my favorite part of my job, and that does allow me to do all the things that I like to do so much, which is travel, talk to developers, uh, help them with their careers, help them to participate in the future of Java. And so when I give this talk, um, I always like to say that Java developers are really the core of what I do, and I believe really the foundation for why Java does continue to be the number one programming language even 20 years after its launch back in the 90s with now over 12 million Java developers around the world and billions of JVMs running and many of them connected to the cloud. And I believe that the reason for this is the fact that we have continued to evolve Java as a technology and programming language around certain philosophies. And those have remained consistent over time. And many of them do relate to the foundation that the JCP program lays. And also intrinsically about the Java technology in terms of its platform completeness, focus on quality and continued focus on security, but also at the same time, making the platform more modern and looking at ways we can increase the innovation coming into the platform, while at the same time bringing in Java developer feedback. And we do that through an open and transparent evolution, but also continuing to focus on the compatibility of the platform, which offers you choices as developers as well as giving you transferability in the projects that you work on using Java technology and enabling really an active ecosystem and that involvement. And I really do believe that that is the reason why Java has continued to be so successful. It's the way that Java is developed and the way that it does enable and grow that ecosystem built all up around it. And many of the, the ways that we do that is through the Java community process. And the JCP has been around almost 20 years now, and it's been through an evolution along with the Java platform, an evolution that started back at Sun Microsystems. And as I go through my talk, I'll talk to you about some of the changes that have been introduced in the community over the last couple of years. Um, but also, just to give you a little bit of context, I created this history slide so you can see that over the history of Java there have always been changes in the community and we have continued to adopt together as a community um, change and evolve and embrace those changes for the better and part of that is through the JCP and also working together with Oracle as the Java steward but Java is not about just in one, any particular vendor. It's not just about Oracle. Um, that really is the great value. So the fact that Java would not be as successful as it is today if there wasn't an invest, the investment coming forward, but also it wouldn't be where it is today if we didn't have the community contributions that Java has. That is truly what makes Java unique, the way it has evolved together with the community and the, why it will continue to be popular in in the future. So Oracle supporting and promoting the Java ecosystem really does benefit everyone. And Oracle plays a role in the JCP organization itself, obviously, but again, as I said, it's not about any one particular vendor. I have the uh, organization chart for the JCP up here. So I'm the executive um, 
committee chairperson and director of the JCP program, but there's a 25 person executive committee that oversees the JCP. So again, not about any one particular um, person or member, but a 25 person executive committee, as well as a small staff uh, that helps me to run the organization. But the bulk of the evolution of the Java technology and the work that goes on through the JCP to make the Java platform happen is done through the membership. And that's why the chart here shows um, the majority um, of the slide really is the work of the members of the JCP. So the specification leads working together with expert group members and those, again, working with the broader community of membership in the Java community, but also anyone who is using Java has an opportunity to give feedback into this process. So really the core of the JCP is about evolving um, the specifications that are used in the Java platform. And I'll share with you just a little bit about what is the JCP before I move through some of the changes that have happened with the platform itself in the last couple of years, and then how specifically you can get involved. So you can join the JCP. It's open to anyone. Uh, well, I did take an opportunity to poll some of our individual members about why they get involved in the JCP. And most of the answers boiled down to one of these two. I just picked out two particular quotes. So the top reason people tend to participate is the fact that they can help to advance their career and increase their visibility in the community, as well as keep up to speed with some of the innovations and changes happening in the platform so they become known in their circle as an expert and a resource to come to when you have questions about changes and things that are um, to be expected and how you can adapt to those changes, but also just about being a core member of, of the community. Some people see it that way. So it's just like being a Java citizen, so to speak. Collaborative development, so the, the bulk of the work in the JCP is done through Java specification requests. Does anyone, anyone familiar with that term, Java specification requests? Okay, so that really, if you had to say, what is it that we do in the JCP, we develop and evolve Java specification requests. So a JSR is a single version of a specification and community members who belong to the JCP can lead JSRs and community members can also serve on the expert group of the JSR, which means that they help the spec lead with the work to complete the JSRs. And every JSR is really three things. So it's not just the code, it's a specification, a reference implementation or the code, and a test suite. So those are the three things um, that every JSR delivers through its development life cycle. Every project that's developed through the JCP follows the same life cycle, no matter who leads it. And it includes a formal review process as well as votes by the executive committee. That means that any change going in to a JSR has to be approved by the executive committee before it can be declared final and put into any shipping products um, or used in code um, that's in production. So everything follows the same cycle and members of the JCP can participate in that process. We now have different levels, which I'll talk to you about when I go into how you can participate. So a JSR is really about these three things. Um, the specification, which is thorough and complete, and one of the main strengths of Java as a technology in terms of it's very thoroughly and completely specified and documented. And that's not by chance, it's because the JCP requires that anything that goes into the Java platform must have a complete specification before it can be final. And it also has to have a complete reference implementation. So that's the code or the implementation of the specification. And thirdly and finally, the last, and I say most important thing is the test suite. So the test suite um, has to be passed. The reference implementation has to pass the test suite. And also this is when community members can come 
and take the specification once it's final and develop their own implementation, run it against the test suite, and therefore be able to verify it as Java compatible. And that really is how we enable that entire ecosystem that I talked about. That's what provides the choices that you have as developers is the fact that it's not just the code, it's not just the specification. So it's not just the standard, it's not just an open source project. It's those three things working together to create an ecosystem around the Java platform. And we do this as an international effort. Um, that's part of the reason uh, that I have the opportunity to visit developers in different parts of the world. I'm here now from California, but we want to have input from developers all over the world, um, different use cases. What, since I have had the opportunity to travel mo to most parts of the world, um, what I've found is there is a lot of commonality, but there are also some differences. Um, and not just in language. Um, so differences in the way the technology is being used and the input that people share. And that, again, is part of the success of Java. Not just an international effort um, geographically, but we also have members of all different types participating in the process. And that, again, is a strength and something that we've evolved over time. When the JCP was first introduced, um, it was primarily about corporate vendors participating in the standardization effort. And what we find today um, is we've evolved over time, and now the majority of people participating in the effort are individual developers. So developers who aren't getting paid to do this, but who are passionate about the technology and want to dedicate their time to giving feedback back to evolving the language. So corporations and not just um, vendors, now we're seeing end user companies. So companies that are actively using the technology and have development teams in-house, um, companies like Twitter, um, Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, and also nonprofit groups. So the Apache Software Foundation and the Eclipse Foundation are actively participating as well as Java user groups. And that's a, a new thing. While Java user groups have been around for quite a while, um, more active involvement and participation in this um, process and evolution has started to come from the Java user groups. So we have membership across all of those different categories. And we see the same thing on the executive committee. So in addition to members being able to participate in the JSR process um, effort, uh, JCB members vote for the executive committee. So that's how the executive committee members are selected. It's a subset of 25 members. Um, but naturally what we've seen over time is that we also have that natural representation, the corporations, nonprofit groups, Java user groups, and individual developers. So we have two Java user groups currently on the executive committee and two individual developers. So not representing any one particular company, but representing the voice of the individual developers who are participating in the program. And the executive committee has the important role of voting on every JSR, both in the beginning as well as at the end of the process. So ensuring that something is ready to be standardized in the Java platform, and then also at the end, ensuring that we've collected um, the feedback from the community and responded to the user input. Um, so the spec lead pr provides um, the three deliverables at the end, the reference implementation, the spec, and the test suite. And the job of the executive committee at that point is to ratify that the work has been done thoroughly and completely and taken into account all the feedback from the community. So it's an important role to play. The executive committee also helps to evolve the JCP program itself over time. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not just um, a standard or the specification, and it's not just an open source project. Java is developed as an open source project, um, but we continue to maintain that it also is important for the continued success of the platform for it to also be developed as a standard. And those two things work together within the JCP with the foundation that I explained to you. Um, we continue to maintain that the, both of those things are important and that is what ensures having the choice in the implementations, but also greater adoption 
adoption of the standards. So you see the code being developed in an open source project and then the specification being written alongside of it. Um, in the closed source days, you saw actually more the opposite, um, where you saw the specification written first and then the code developed to comply to the specification. But now with um, Java being developed in an open source manner, uh, you see the opposite. So the code leading and the specification being written along the way to follow. So that would be the, the primer on what is the JCP and what is the work that we do. And for the rest of my talk, I'll focus on the three things that my organization will continue to um, evolve. And that is, first of all, the technology, so new revisions of the Java platform itself. Secondly, how we can change and modify the JCP as the structure to keep up with those technology changes. And then thirdly, and most importantly, how we can have your continued participation. So continued participation from the developer community. Starting with uh, the platform evolution. So you may or may not be aware um, that Java, the Java platform is actually developed through an open source project called OpenJDK. And OpenJDK is organized with JEPs. So since most of you heard, have heard of JSRs, you've probably also heard the term JEP. Am I correct? Yes. So in OpenJDK, JEPs are how they, are, they organize the projects within OpenJDK. That's in a Java enhancement proposal. And the JEPs feed up into JSRs. So those two things work together. Um, and there's often a confusion. So if we have OpenJDK, if we have JEPs, what's the JSR? So essentially, there are more JEPs than there are JSRs. There's multiple JEPs that will go into any one version of the Java platform, and usually a JSR that um, maps to the JEPs that fall into that platform. So the work of the JEPs developed in OpenJDK feed up into a JSR, which then the executive committee ratifies um, at the beginning as well as at the end of the project. So the Java platforms currently, the last major release is Java 12. How many people are aware that Java 12 is the last major release of Java? And how many people are, are using Java um, 8 in production? Almost every, everyone in the room, just about. Anyone who's using um, a version higher than Java 8 in production? Oh, a few of you. So you're very advanced here in Barcelona. I'm happy to see that. So more, most commonly when I give this talk, um, the, um, a, lo a lot of the members um, that I asked to raise their hand are using Java 8, which is great to see. Um, the last version of the Java platform is Java 12. Uh, so starting with Java 9, there were uh, some changes that were introduced. So first of all, obviously, Java 9 introduced um, modularity into the Java platform, and that really enabled us to have that change of a faster release cadence. So we announced that at that time that we would start to have Java releases come out every six months, then Java, new Java releases coming out every three to four years. Um, in addition to that faster release cadence, we said for the JDK, we're going to also introduce to the Java ecosystem the idea of long-term support uh, releases. So um, the community has come along with that in terms of also um, offering long-term support releases. So um, you have different choices in terms of the distributions. Um, that means that Java 11 is the first long-term support release. And every three years, the releases will be um, offered. So Java 11 is the first long-term support release. The next long-term support release will be Java 17, coming out three years later. And one last change announced at that time was Oracle announced that they would open source um, some features that they were keeping as proprietary in the Oracle JDK. So pu putting the um, Oracle commercial features into OpenJDK, and that was done over time. Um, so increasing the innovation um, over time, putting uh, some of the features that used to be proprietary into the open source um, project into OpenJDK, and that was done progressively over time. But again, following that same process of putting it into JEPs and then the JEPs feeding up into JSRs and mapping to the different release um, platforms. And that was completed as of uh, Java 11. Um, so things like Flight Recorder and Mission Control are now part of Project OpenJDK. 
So starting with Java 9, that was a big release. It was, um, I think most developers thought of it as um, Project Jigsaw, um, which was about modularity. But actually, in Java 9, there were over 100 other new features that went into the platform. It was released back in September 2017. And that was pretty typical size for a major release that focused on a feature. And how that used to work in the Java community, which you're probably aware, is we would pick one project, and we would work on that project project and the platform would not be released until that project was finished and that's why oftentimes you would see the dates moving in between project releases and oftentimes it was three to four years in between major releases with um, very significant changes in between the platform releases. So what we, since we announced at that time we were moving to a faster release cadence of new um, Java platforms every six months, and that has been the case. So the first six months later, um, we came out with JDK 10. So that was released about a year ago, March 2018. That was developed uh, through a JSR in the JCP, but it included 12 Java enhancement proposals, or JEPs. Um, so as you can see, that's quite a smaller um, incremental change than what we're accustomed to seeing with major Java platform releases. Um, six months later in September of 2018, JDK 12 came out. Um, so that's 17 different JEPs. And what we saw with the community is most of the tooling community really did, was able to keep up with this faster release cadence. So even though, as I took a show of hands, most of you are using Java 8 in production, the tooling ecosystem around Java is continuing to keep up to date. So the major IDEs were also coming out and announcing. They were ready on Java 11 very soon afterwards, which is the hashtag I have shown there, works like heaven on JDK 11. So making an effort to work with the community, and that's part of what I will show in my last section of the talk, how to participate, is some opportunities for you to participate in open source projects that are built up around the Java platform. But the last uh, JDK release and the current JDK release, if you go to OpenJDK and want to download the, the latest um, version that you can use in production is Java 12. And that was developed through JSR 386 and has... Um, eight different JEPs targeted. So the way that works in the new model is that whatever's ready within the six month release window is what is in implemented um, and integrated into the mainline build and put into the shipping version of the platform. So that means that you have certain things coming out of the projects that continue to be developed in OpenJDK as soon as they're ready, rather than waiting multiple years for the project to complete and having those changes come into the platform. So that's what enables more of the innovation when I talked about the philosophies in the beginning, being able to modernize and bring in new innovations in the platform, the faster release cadence enables us to do that by having an opportunity to put any new features that are ready into the um, versions that are shipping in production with Java 12 being the last major release that's currently available. And we're already working on Java 13. So there's a JSR filed for Java 13. Um, that's JSR 388. And it's planned to be released in September of this year. Um, there already are early access builds out there. Um, we did start this concept of early access builds quite a while ago, but it becomes even more important now that we have releases coming out every six months. That's really the way for you as developers to um, be able to preview what's going to be in the next version of the platform. And as you start to think about how you're going to keep up and migrate to newer versions, being able to have those early access builds available on a bi-weekly basis to evaluate and test your applications becomes even more critical. So whether or not you're going to be planning to migrate to the new version of Java in production, getting into the habit of downloading the early access builds and providing feedback into the projects um, because it becomes an important part of the development cycle rather than waiting several years in between platform releases to think about it. So that's why I believe it becomes even more essential to start thinking about how you can contribute and participate in the community versus consuming what's being developed and ratified through um, the JCP process and work happening in OpenJDK. So the next slide um, I talk about is um, 
OpenJDK continues to also, in addition to having the platform projects listed in OpenJDK, the ones I just went through, like 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, um, the feature projects. So those are still part of OpenJDK. And if you want to find out some of the new things um, and what's that's coming in the feature and innovation pipeline, you can go to these projects being developed in OpenJDK. All of these projects are open uh, to the community, so you don't need to be a member. Um, you can join the mailing list if you want to participate in the discussions. Um, but this is really where the future um, of work of what's going to be going into new versions of the platform will come from. And so rather than picking any one particular project that will be the next version of Java, things out of each one of these projects will come out as they're ready. But I, I have a slide um, that maps to some of the investments that the OpenJDK Java SE platform team is making. So, And then I'll have a slide for each one of the projects that I picked. I didn't list every project happening in OpenJDK. I just picked a few significant ones um, that are currently being worked on, as well as mapping them to some categories of things that will be coming and focus the focus of the Java platform. So if there's a particular area of interest for you, um, um, that you think applies to the work that you do on a daily basis, or maybe an area that you want to get into, you would then pick that project and follow along. So each project has its own page um, where you can view um, the discussions and um, as well as view the overview of the project. So obviously security being the number one priority, um, but also some other things um, that we'll be focused on in terms of changes and innovations in the Java platform. And there's a talk tomorrow that'll do a deep dive into these projects by Brian Getz. So I highly encourage you to attend that talk. This, this um, version of my talk is really just to give you an idea of the project, and then you can go do a deep dive into those projects at a later time. So starting with Project Valhalla, Project Valhalla Valhalla is about value types and um, optimizing code. Secondly, Project Portola. So Project Portola is about Java in the world of containers. So how to ensure that Java remains the first choice for implementations in the cloud and deployments that are in the cloud and containers. Project ZGC, so a scalable uh, low latency garbage collector. I believe this is just um, targeted for Java 13. This has its own project that you can follow. Project Panama, uh, so um, focused on making Java uh, work in a big data machine learning environment. Improve, also improve Java native interoperability and looking at a replacement for our JNI. That's happening in Project Panama. Project Loom, so looking at the Java concurrency model. Um, the goal of this project would be to have millions of fibers that can spawn into a single JVM instance. And Project Amber, which is a collection of smaller language improvements. Um, one of the things that actually came out as a preview feature out of Project Amber is switch expressions. So that's currently available as a preview feature in Java 12. But this new things that go into, will go into Project Amber will be collected here as Java enhancement proposals. So this will change over time what goes into, comes out of Project Amber. And some of these projects have their own early access builds. So in addition to the early access builds of the platform as well as the current release of the platform, there are a few projects which offer their own early access builds. Um, in particular, Project Panama and Project Valhalla. So jdk.java.net is where you can go to download not only the latest release of Java, but also the early access builds. And you'll also find um, notes there um, for um, running the early access builds. So that completes uh, the first section that I told you I would share with you. So changes happening to the Java platform. If you want to follow along um, Twitter, OpenJDK is a great handle to follow for that. You can also become an OpenJDK contributor in addition to following the discussions of the projects that I just mentioned. So that's really the first step in how you would get more involved in OpenJDK. 
And along with the other changes I mentioned, um, also a new thing that just came out uh, through the Oracle University is training and certification for Java 11. So that's currently available if you're interested in training and certifications. So the second part that I said I would share with you was changes to the JCP structure overall. So changing the constitution of the JCP with all these changes that I just shared in the Java platform and ecosystem, we also need to adapt the rules and the structure around how the projects are evolved. And that's done with the cooperation of the executive committee. So I work on that as the spec lead um, with the executive committee of the JCP serving as my expert group. And I'll just share with you a few of the changes that we've made um, over the last couple of years. First being transparency. So with Java being developed in the open, um, it's also important for not just the members to be able to view the work that's happening in the projects, but the entire Java community. So we've modified the rules of the JCP to require that everything is done in the open and in a transparent way. So it's requiring open mailing lists and open issue trackers that you can view for all of the, ch all of the projects that I just mentioned. And secondly, the executive committee itself. Uh, so we used to have a larger executive committee, actually multiple executive committees, um, but really with the focus on the Java platform itself, we merged the executive committees and we're currently looking at whether we should resize the executive committee to make it a little um, more reflective of the work being done through the JCP at this time. So that's something that's an ongoing effort, um, the executive committee itself. And then thirdly, how can we increase the participation and be able to move more quickly? Um, so some of the processes that were written around evolving tech, the Java technology were written at a time when the software development was done in a much different way. So looking at how can we increase the participation and be able to move faster while still following the same, essentially the same process. So first, looking at broadening the membership, like I shared with you, we now have a quite a broad um, membership in the JCP, but we did that by looking at how we could eliminate the barriers that were pre preventing certain types of developers to participate. Um, so individual developers or smaller companies, for instance. So eliminating the membership fees, there's currently no fees to participate in the JCP, and also allowing electronic signatures um, and introducing a new level of membership that doesn't require employer um, signature for individual developers. So those were some of the things that were barriers to people participating. Fees, cumbersome processes, as well as approval from employers. So while there still is some approval needed for certain types of participation, what we found was one size fits all doesn't necessarily work. So when the JCP was developed, it was essentially designed for a corporate member. But as I share with you, we have many different types of members now, so we introduced new membership levels. And again, can't randomly do that. We have to do that um, through cooperation with the executive committee. So we have associate members, which is essentially for individual developers. It's a smaller, lightweight contribution agreement that doesn't require any um, employer signature to be executed. And then a partner membership. So for those Java user groups, like I talked about being able to have Java user groups participate in the process. Again, a Java user group doesn't operate or have the same responsibilities as a corporation, so we need a new membership level for them. And we continue to maintain the full members, um, which we do have quite a few, several hundred individual Java developers, but essentially um, a corporation joins as a full member. They couldn't join as a partner member or an associate member. Um, so a full member would lead a, can lead a JSR, be on an expert group, and vote for the executive committee members. Um, associate members can vote for their to a membership seats as well as serve on contributors of JSRs. Then the final thing that we did was streamline the JSR development cycle. So um, the JSR process when it was initially conceived was written in more a style um, keeping with the waterfall method um, with a, a longer release cycle. So we streamlined the JSR development cycle to be a little bit more agile um, in the way um, that open source projects are developed and Java is an open source project today. So open development period, but still having 
that um, cutoff in terms of when contributions must be complete and when the executive committee can vote on that JSR before it can become final and put into any shipping um, projects in production. And we'll continue to evolve this over time. This last change that we introduced was just in December 2018. But again, that's the work that the JCP Executive Committee does is look at, look at the changes in the landscape and adapt and modify our processes to keep up to date. So the JCP becomes even more open than it was before, just like Java itself. And that leads me to the last part of the talk, which is how will you participate? And over time, what we found is that individuals can participate and contribute, and we allow for that. But what we found is that people working as a part of a team um, can be better. It's produces better feedback, as well as it's a better experience for the developers. So working together, um, even if it's a small group of developers through their Java user group or through their employer, whether it's a few developers that you get together at lunch, you help each other, you teach each other, you work together. And working together, we can achieve more. Um, we introduced this ability for Java user group members to participate specifically. And at this time, we have 80 different Java user groups participating, not yet any in Spain, but um, since the time that I've been here uh, this week, we're talking about um, creating a tour where I go visit several user groups in Spain to have participation from the local Java user groups. And we can highlight those um, through the platform releases. And not only does that help um, the Java platform and create that feedback into the process, but it also helps to drive ad adoption within your community, creates some more excitement around your local community in terms of new um, activities, um, and also more visibility and ability to get um, sponsors in terms of drawing in those younger developers um, that also like more of those hands-on activities. So I'll share with you um, essentially the five steps I typically um, suggest for groups of developers to follow, whether you're participating with your Java user group or you decide to collect a few of your friends or some of the developers that you work with in your um, at your employer. First thing to do is pick Pick a project, right? So pick a JSR, um, pick uh, one of the projects that I talked to you about that are being evolved through OpenJDK. That's the first thing. In addition to the Java platform itself, there are a few standalone JSRs that are offered. Um, so I've listed those here for you. Um, so a standalone JSR is something that is based on the Java platform, but is not intended to be bundled into any particular Java release. So a few um, recent examples that have been finalized are the Java Money API, as well as units of measurement. And these are some of the ones that are being currently developed. Um, so visual recognition in particular is in the early stages that could use some help, as well as the desktop application API, if we have any des desktop developers in the room, and the units of measurement API 2.0. So pick, pick a thing. Also the Java platforms, those are listed here. Um, but essentially, it works the same way. You pick something and then go to the project page. So if it's one of the project pages that I listed in OpenJDK, it's there. Um, every JSR has a page that looks exactly the same. So in addition to every JSR following the same life cycle, it has the same page where you can find all of that information, the public downloads, the public discussion list, and the public issue tracker. You're also going to find their contact information for the project lead. And that also is essential because at this point, you need to communicate. So don't just decide you're going to go develop something and then throw it over the wall and expect it to be um, welcomed. You should have a communication going on. So it, read through some of the um, work being developed and let the project lead know that you're interested and then decide together on the next steps. Um, these are just a few ideas of things that you can do and some things that um, groups and individual developers have done. Um, so sharing ideas and feedback on the list and issue tracker, 
downloading the early access um, implementations and giving feedback, that's really essential. So it can be feedback on the code, but what's also particularly um, helpful is feedback on the specification itself. Um, you'd be surprised how few um, p comments come in on the specifications that are developed through the open process. So the project leads are always um, very anxious to have feedback on that. And again, I know these can be quite lengthy, um, but you can say, your feedback is based on a particular section, for inst instance. You don't have to take on the entire specifications. Um, also, just socializing, so sharing um, things that are happening in the project or developing a workshop where you teach people about the, the change that's coming, evaluating the community. And then make sure you're sharing this on the public discussion forum and the issue tracker. So um, oft, a, f a few times what I've seen communities do is have a hack day and collect their feedback, but then not share it so that the project leads aware of it. So that's really part of that feedback process is having your activity, but then also sharing it. Um, that's part of the reason why we have everything public and available um, to all the discussion forums as well as the issue tracker. So participate and put your feedback there. And finally, I suggest um, participating in a hack day or a workshop, organizing that together and having fun. I know here at this conference, there is a hacker garden in the expo area, so stop by. Um, find some people who might be interested in a project that you're interested in that you're hearing about here today. This is an example of a hacker garden that we did back in October in San Francisco at the Oracle Code One from people all over the world. So working together, we really can achieve more, and you can connect with people all over the world. Um, participating in OpenJDK um, is easy to do. Download the early access builds. Um, also in OpenJDK, there is a group specifically designed for people who are new to contributing to OpenJDK, and that's the adoption group. Um, so just like the projects where I talked about the technology that's being developed, there's another project um, in OpenJDK called the adoption group. And as part of the adoption group, there's also a quality outreach group. So in the adoption group, if you have suggestions or you don't know where to go, um, that's a great place to get started um, in the project. And then the quality outreach group, as I mentioned, there's a whole ecosystem around the platform. The quality outreach group is a subsection of the adoption group, and this is where there are free and open source projects, um, a matrix listed. So there's over 100 projects listed there now. Um, this is also a project that you can join. Um, you can contact the project leads and tell them that you're interested in helping that project stay up to date with the newest release. So what we've seen is that many projects that are corporate based are, are keeping up to date um, because they have that sponsorship from a corporation. But if it's a free and open source project, oftentimes they need some extra help from the community. So these are just a couple of the projects that are available there um, that are actively participating, Apache Maven and Eclipse Collections, but there's over 100 there. So I encourage you to go check out that matrix and see if there's something that you'd like to work on. Um, and then the early access builds are available. You can also give feedback into the adoption group. We really do need you to participate, whether you decide to participate through OpenJDK as a contributor or you join the JCP and follow our news online. Um, I encourage you to visit the Hacker Garden here uh, today, um, today, tomorrow, and the next day. And then also, um, I've met many of you that are in the audience also at um, previously Java 1, which is now Oracle Code 1. So I will be there, and we'll have a Hacker Garden there, um, as well as our annual JCP party. It's an opportunity to interact with the global community. Um, while I always enjoy visiting uh, different conferences all around the world, that really is one of the unique conferences where I meet people from every different part of the world. Thank you for your time here today. Um, I do believe I have a few time for questions. If I don't answer your question or we run out of time, you can find me on Twitter. Please follow me on Twitter. That's Heather VC, or you can contact me via email at heather at jcp.org. Okay. 
All right. Well, I think it's time for the party now. So working together, we can achieve more. Thanks for coming to my talk. I look forward to interacting you with you in social media and coming back to Spain next year. <laughs> Thank you.